memorial service for Brother Ray Osmond Lindbergh. My name is Bishop Mark Webb. I'm the Bishop of the Warren Orchard Fifth Ward. And I'll be conducting today. And President Joyle Mortimer, first counselor in the state presidency, is presiding. Also, I'd like to recognize my counselors, John Gill and Mark Charrington, who are seated on the stand. We will begin our meeting by singing opening hymn, hymn number 131, More Holiness in Me, and then an opening prayer will be offered by uh, Diane Forrest Linford, a daughter in law. Then we will have a musical number 
a house becomes a home by the grandchildren. We'll go to that point in the program. So a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in uh, Sacramento, sitting in church before Sacramento, and a friend approached to uh, shake my hand to greet me. And I, as I went to stand up, he said, "Oh, you don't, you don't need to stand up." And I, uh, as I stood up and shook his hand, I said, "My father taught me better than that." And um, this reminds me of a story that happened uh, many years ago when I was uh, probably 40 years ago or so. I was at the tabernacle with my father and his mission president, uh, President Walter Stover. And this was a twice uh, a yearly tradition that we always went to conference. And um, President Elder, Elder Packer, an apostle, came off the stand to come down to greet my dad's mission president, Walter Stover. Um, and we all stood, of course, to greet Elder Packer. And after being introduced, Elder Packer by his mission president, Elder Packer turned to my father and said, you're one of Walter Stover's missionaries. You should be a better man than you are. <laughs> and uh, this uh, compliment to President Stover and gentle instruction to my father was one of my dad's favorite stories. And it reminds me of what my dad did his whole life to make himself a better man. Some, some stories have surprise endings, right? But we all know my dad's ending. It's, it's all around us, right? He was so successful in life. Even the things the world cares about, he was successful, but even in things of, of much more important, right? Um, but he has a surprise at the beginning, perhaps, to some of you who may not know it. He was raised by wonderful, faithful parents. He was the youngest of six. But they were very poor. Both his parents worked hard and lived paycheck to paycheck, sometimes missing paychecks. And my dad, starting in junior high, all the way through high school, worked hard, 40 or more hours a week at a bakery. Not not for himself, but he gave that check to my, my grandparents to help support the family. <laughs> my dad's life is filled with hard work and good choices to make himself a better man. He, after grad, so he worked 40 hours a week and he was valedictorian. And then he went off to, to college where he continued to work and pay his way. He then went on a mission, a, a great financial sacrifice for him and his, and his parents. And then came the best choice of his life. Well, the, the precursor to his best choice. He joined the military. He loved our country and served and worked hard to serve our country. But that put him in Washington, D.C., which is where he needed to be to be mom. And they chose, chose each other. I think my dad's voice went a long way to woo my mother. <laughs> and it continues to show his love for us throughout his whole life for us. And then they together continue to work hard and make choices to bring us to this point. 14 years of college and medical school training, including a two year gap where he did not get into medical school, but continued to work and struggle and got into medical school and became a doctor. And then you can tell a man by where he puts his most effort, his most time, his money, because of where he served the Lord. He served the Lord throughout his life in many callings. And then, which actually kept my parents apart often. He'd be off at this meeting or he'd be up on the stand. But then my parents served six missions together. And that brought them together and serving the Lord. The one thing that struck me about my father was, is where he would put his heart, and his heart was with the Lord. He knew with surety that there was a resurrection, 
that there was a plan for our happiness, that Jesus Christ died for us, and that we, through him, are saved. I am a child of God. I am a son of a great leader, and I should be a better man than I am. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Not sure how David just did that. <laughs> so, uh, my father's, and I'm sure all my brothers and sisters have a different version of this, but his favorite scripture for me was uh, Doctrine and Covenants 1924, which is search diligently, pray always, and be believing. And all things shall work together for your good. If you walk uprightly and remember the covenant, we're with you, if you have covenanted. He said that to me often. And I'm sure my brothers and sisters have their favorite scripture with dad, but that was ours. Um, that with dad, he had something different with all of us. Um, one of his favorite sayings, and my favorite saying of his was, it's a great life if you don't weaken. Now, the smart aleck kid and me always then followed that up with, it's even better if you do. But <laughs> dad never chastised me for that. But he would then follow it up. No, it's a great life if you don't weaken us. The three most important things to add were the gospel, <laughs> my mother, of course, that didn't mail to all of us. Um, everything dad did was about those two things. Growing up, we would go on trips, we'd go skiing in Utah, and we'd come up for general conference. And we'd come up skiing, and we'd stay at my grandparents' home in Ogden, and we'd sleep on the floors covered in newspapers and sleeping bags. And I'm sure there were easier ways to handle that. But my father wanted us to get to know our grandparents well. And so we did that. And then, of course, we'd go skiing. And my father, I'm sure, did not enjoy skiing. He hated the cold. <laughs> That's why he left on to deal with it. But family first to my father. Uh, at one point, we got a truck with a camper on the back and went up and for a trip up the coast. And we were uh, went all the way up the uh, California coast, got into Washington, as we, we were going to go up into Canada, and then um, at that point, we had to go to the funeral in Utah. Uh, this camper followed us around for a while. We ended up going on many, many family trips in this camper. And looked, like all of Dad's cars, it ended in tragic totaling on the way to a trip to Utah. Uh, we had a deer, and Dad immediately wondered how, what he was doing. It wasn't about the truck, it wasn't about the money we just lost, it was about family first. Um, my love for sports certainly came from my father. You haven't lived so you've driven across the desert, you know, uh, listening to an AM radio, coat hanger for an antenna, uh, listening to UCLA playing in the NCAA tournament with my father. Families listening, barely here, screaming at everything, yelling at the refs through the through the radio. Um, but my love for sports in that it was never about winning for me. So growing up, uh, there's at one point um, I ran track and I won three gold medals a couple years in a row in the citywide track meet to take the champion's trophy home. And my father, although I'm sure he was very proud of that, that was not, that is not the story that my father would tell. From my, track, from my father, his joy came from seeing me uh, help a competitor improve their high jump form who was competing against me. He felt that was far more important than me winning the gold medal. 
it was far more important for me to be kind to the people around me. That was my father. Uh, on a business trip to the UK many, many, many years ago, I was near Stonehenge uh, on break. And I went into a gas station and I ran into Elder Faust. And kind of a tender mercy, Elder Faust was literally on his way to Jerusalem, to the, to the um, Jerusalem Center, and he was having a meeting with my mother and father in two days. And I just happened to run into him in a gas station in the UK. Um, so I handed him my business card. And I said, okay, gotta give this to my dad. And I wrote on it, it's a great life if you don't weaken. <laughs> and then I took my tie off and I said, you need to give this to my dad. My dad and I had a thing where he would say, I like your tie. I love your tie and I would hand him my tie. And so any ties that you've seen my father in, in the last 30 years have been my tie. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing I got to The last thing I got to do for my father was to buy his dog. And as I'm tying his dog, I'm thinking of his favorite, favorite scripture and his saying, it's great life if you don't weaken, which is, uh, which is what that scripture means. And all I can say is, I grew up in such a wonderful family. We're such wonderful parents. And I say this in the name of Christ. Amen. Austin, I have a deal. If I can't make it through, he's going to finish it up. <laughs> but I do write mine down so he can. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. My dad was the perfect embodiment of the scripture. He taught me unconditional love and charity through his example. I am the sixth of eight children. I always felt my father had a soft spot for me. In my childhood years, I could be difficult, and occasionally my mom and dad had to go behind closed doors to discuss what to do with me. <laughs> In these desperate moments, I always felt like my dad was my advocate. I remember saying to mother, wait until I talk to dad, and he will hear what you just did. <laughs> dad always defended mom, but I knew he always was looking out for me and understood me. This deep understanding of Dad's unconditional love had a significant impact on my whole life. After I graduated from BYU, I moved to Los Angeles to work. I was dating someone that my parents were anxious about, and I remember receiving a letter from my dad one day sharing his concerns with his love. It had a deep impact on my perspective. A few months later, my sister Anne was getting married. She invited her handsome missionary friend, Jim Kuhn, to the wedding. He spent the night at my parents' house and drove to the LA temple with my parents and Anne. As they were walking into the temple, my dad leaned down to Jim and said, you know, Anne is getting married, but I still have one daughter left. <laughs> Months later, when I was working in the busy tax season in Los Angeles, I was using my parents' car because mine was in the shop getting fixed. I came out of work at 3 a.m. in the morning and walked to the monitor parking to find that my car was missing. My keys had been stolen by the valet chef area. I called dad, frantic and sobbing, it was hard for him to even understand me. And I, I had just awakened him from a deep sleep. He said, what, what, are you okay? I still could not get a coherent word out. He said, did Jim break up with you? <laughs> for some reason that brought me out of my hysteria. And I said, no, my car was stolen. 
He said, oh, that's easy. Don't even worry about that. We have to get that fixed. <laughs> I reminded him it was his car. And he said, even better. <laughs> now that I'm a parent, I know what those 3 a.m. phone calls are like. And I'm in awe at my dad's loving and his measured response. And I'm still working on showing my children unconditional love during those times. I aspire to be more like my dad and mom and their parents. Dad and mom had always been my lifeline. My first call times of crisis. Because I know what they will get me, they will just get it. And they'll have empathy no matter what. All of us children knew how much dad loved mom. He would always talk about how he'd married above himself. I used to ask him if there was anything that bothered him about my mom. He said, well, once in a while, she burned the toast. <laughs> the marriage looked so easy and blissful. In my younger days, I remember dad always coming home from a long, hard day of work and saying, Joanne, darling, what can I do to help you? My mother didn't buy very much for herself. And I remember her showing dad a new pair of shoes. And he said, well, if you love them, get them in every color they have. I'm so grateful for my father's example of unconditional love, specifically to me, but also to mom. Because dad modeled that behavior so beautifully, I feel it has been easier for me to know and feel that my heavenly father and my savior love me. I'm so grateful for that gift. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. As the grandchildren are coming up, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the song, A House Becomes a Home, that they're going to sing. Our family has sung this song for many years, and my dad was asked to sing this song years ago, and he thought it was too short, so he added a couple verses to this song, and that even makes it more special for all of us.
Recently, every time I saw my dad or talked to him on the phone, he'd say, how's my favorite nurse? Or, there's the hospice nurse. He'd say something about my being a nurse. That was our connection, is that medical connection. We, I remember forever, um, he'd say to people, Anne's been a nurse since forever, since she was just a little girl. And I think I was. I remember being fascinated by anything he did in that medical realm and wanted to be right in the middle of it. Um, and he almost let me be right in the middle of it. Once, after a miscarriage my mom had, she was bleeding heavily. And I remember, and I couldn't have been more than eight years old or so, him lifting the foot of the bed onto some bricks so that she was in that Trendelenburg position where she had that assistance of having the foot up above her head. And he started an IV, and I was his IV pole until he arranged to hang that IV bag somewhere. And I was little, but I remember being in on this. Off on our kitchen table was a temporary OR for people getting stitches, neighbors, friends, people in the ward, a lot of family members, often John. <laughs> I would be the one to hold pressure on the wound or hand him instruments or stitch the length of the stitch just right. Once I asked Dad, what's the longest medical word you know? And he said, well, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. And I learned that word and, had it, and he taught me the meaning of it. And one time he was away, but somebody came and knocked on the door, a neighbor with her son. And Dad wasn't home, but they wanted to know what his condition was that their son had. And he had these purple spots all over him. And I said, I know it sounds strange, but I think he may be an idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. <laughs> and it turns out I was right. <laughs> Actually, as time went on, I felt that Dad kind of relied on my input as a nurse. He made me feel like a valued peer. A few years back, my mother was experiencing some abdominal pain, enough that she told me, I almost called you last night at about one in the morning. She didn't, but they called me in the morning. And mom, dad called me and said, I think you ought to come over and see mom. She's having quite a bit of pain. And if you know my mom, she never complains about pain. In fact, in retrospect, she won't say that she was having pain during this time. But she used to call having a baby just a little pressure. <laughs> so, Anyway, I went over and I asked her where she was hurting and I felt her abdomen where she told me she was hurting and there was a large hard mass and I had dad come over and I said, is this the right thing to be feeling here? And it turns out it was not normal. And my mother had gallbladder surgery the next day and it turns out actually that gallbladder had been bad for a long time, the doctor said, but of course, probably just a little pressure. <laughs> I would be my brother's keeper. I would learn the healer's art. To the wounded and the weary, I would show 
a gentle heart. I would be my brother's keeper, Lord. I would follow thee. Dad lived these words. I worked in my dad's office for many, many years. I honestly can't tell you how many times he would come out with a patient from the exam room and kind of quietly, so as not to embarrass that patient, say, there will be no charge for this patient. Time and time again, he took bad care of others. It's interesting because I remember working for an ophthalmologist who charged his own mother. <laughs> so there's the difference. I can, well, there you go. Um, Dad served five medical missions all over the world with mom at his side. In Luke chapter 9, verses 2 and 6, it says, and he sent them to the king. There's a, supposed to be a word here. The, the computer got rid of it, and I don't remember what it was supposed to say. It was this little italicized word. He sent them to heal in the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Who here hasn't been advised by dad to soak in hot water, hydrate, 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 wash your hands while singing happy birthday so that you wash long enough, or snuff and gargle with salt water? One of the most significant and vivid memories of my childhood was the night we heard about the sudden tragic death of my mom's sister Elaine. We were at a piano recital at the home of piano te our piano teacher. Someone somehow reached my grandparents who were there by phone to let them know of this tragic thing. I recall us returning home in our VW bus on this windy road, my dad driving, and he was sobbing, just wrapped with grief. And I just remember the love he had for Elaine, but the sorrow he was feeling for my mom and for Elaine's children, and knowing that that was something he could not stitch up and make better. The urge he had to heal was so strong that he was unable to help in that situation. Last Saturday on Pioneer Day, my mother called me at 3.50 in the morning and said, I think Ray has, he's breathing his last breaths. I arrived at their home about 4 to see that she was likely correct. I could tell as a hospice nurse, this time as his hospice nurse, that it was getting very close to when he would pass away. We called all of my brothers and sisters to let them know as many of us that could come did come. I placed, we gathered around my dad and sang as he breathed his last breath. I placed my fingers to his wrist and throat to find a pulse. I listened to his heart with my, with my stethoscope to confirm that he was gone. At 5.37, he died. After his passing, I was able to wash his body with some of my siblings. We dressed him in clean scrubs, which seems appropriate somehow. I felt such reverence as I performed this last act of service for him. Dad had a testimony of the greatest healer of them all, the great physician our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of the certainty of Dad's testimony of the loving Father and a Savior that atone for each of us and will touch each of us and heal us if we will let him, I do know these things. I know that Jesus Christ provided a plan of happiness for us all. I know that I will see Dad again of the same certain in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
we all mourn his loss, but we'll see him again. I ask for peace and strength in my mom and siblings and grandchildren all who love them dearly, that he loved as well. My name is John and I was born with goodly parents. The best. The best. I had to have them. I couldn't have made it. I couldn't have made it with them. It had to be. They had to be my parents. I'm the fourth of eight. I surprised myself to write this talk and came prepared to, to talk to talk to an honored man who was always prepared. He was always prepared. see the talk that I wrote. I, I had the privilege of he he laid in our in, in, in their house in his house and I sat last night about three in the morning got prepared and wrote this talk with him in the room. And I feel it like but I mean I feel his love so much. I love my family and my children. I love my dad. He had the most wisdom of any man that I knew. The most integrity of any man is integrity of steel. And he said he was going to do it. He did it. He did it. He got it done. He taught me how to come prepared. And I broke the rules a lot. <laughs> I broke the rules a lot. I tested my I tested my mother and my father's patience to the max. <laughs> my father is my hero. Everybody loved him. Everybody loved him, and he was a giant of a man. He, my father was a giant of a man, and I think that everybody here, I think all all of us that know him, he was almost all all of our fathers. He was a father to all of us, and he, it was easy. He was the father to all of us because that's the way he acted. He acted like the father to all of us. And he, and he meant. And my father taught me how to love unconditionally, and I try to do that. But I, but I was a handful. And we'll just leave it there. <laughs> We'll leave it to everybody's imagination here. <laughs> one of the things he taught me was to own up to your mistakes. You know, to own it. And then move on, you know, do apologize. To apologize immediately and move on. He was a hard worker. He was everybody's doctor. He was the neighbor's doctor. He was old school. He worked on patients all his life. He worked it. He told me. He told me that was his, you know, kind of his his thing. You know, that he needed more of. And he prayed for more of it. And I tried to learn how to, to love unconditionally um, unconditionally, like he, he taught us. He also he always also taught us about forgiveness. He was very, very quick to forgive and really easy to talk to. And I think the reason why I, I feel so much like my parents were the only ones that I, I was really able to lay it out with my parents and play it right out on the line. I had no problem telling them everything about me, even the things they didn't want to hear. 
He gave his life to God through hard work and service. He had an unbelievable voice. He shared with all of us. We were taught through music and hard work. And I love my music. And it's it's brought a lot of peace and comfort to me through this time. And I have a great love for history, and I'm pretty proud to be the son of a man who was born on Halloween, and he died on Pioneer Day. <laughs> and my dad was a pioneer, and he acted like one. It didn't surprise me at all that he died on Pioneer Day. I had the greatest parents that a child could have. They're legendary. We wear Joanna Ray Turns 90 shirts. They're all over the internet. All the grandchildren are always asked about it. And I've, I've always tried to have my kids involved with my parents' life. What a, what a posterity they've left. We can fill the whole chapel with just our family. <laughs> My, mom, my father made sure that we all knew that he loved our mother and that he told us often and he complimented her a lot. I'm so grateful that everybody's come today. I love my family and I've been telling him I've been telling some of my sisters lately that I love them the most. It's true. And girls are easier to love. <laughs> but I try to treat them equally. Kindness and love and forgive 
And he taught me patience because he didn't have a lot of it sometimes. <laughs> and I love you all, especially my siblings and above all my children, and my mother, and my parents and my father is a shining example of how we all should be. And how we should all forgive make sure we love love the ones that we are close to kind of a tender mercy that I get pretty much a lot I get tender mercies daily and I'm constantly looking for God and you know I spent some time on this talk because I didn't want my, kid, my, my sisters to you know I mean I'm, I, I really tried to I'm not one to write talk, and I, I did this out of respect because he would have wanted me to come prepared. My brother, I, I've written this talk, and my brother reached back a little bit and goes, he says, is this yours? And it was like the first page of my talk, like I had two pages of it, and the first page was, I didn't know I didn't have it. Isn't that God right there? <laughs> Saving my tail. Okay. I love my family. I say it like it is. I'm not afraid to do it. I love all my cousins. They're like sisters and brothers to me. Elaine and Grace. Kids of my cousins. I had the greatest child of the greatest family of the greatest parents. And I was truly blessed. And in Jesus Christ, amen. amen. My dad loved mom. He thought she was the most beautiful woman on earth. When he saw mom across the room for the first time, he told his friend, I'm going to marry that girl. That was on a Sunday. He proposed her by the next Sunday. <laughs> when he sees my mom across the room, he would spontaneously, if you were with him, say, isn't she the most beautiful woman on earth? Dad all said, marry above yourself, pray. Then he would remind me that he had and that I had. Dad always put mom first. Sometimes when he'd go out to eat, there was a salad bar. He'd say, Joanne, darling, are you having onions? And then only put onions on his salad if she was. <laughs> Dad was always attentive, taking mom's arm, holding the door for her. He treated her like a queen, always wanting to show for her when they drove. They were so close that when someone once joked with them that they were splitting the ward and the boundary was going to be right down the middle of his bed, Dad replied, that's okay, we sleep on the same side of the bed. <laughs> Dad loved going to the temple with Mom. One of my favorite things was to do ceilings as a family on their anniversary. Dad always said, do you know how much I love your mother? Yes, Dad. <laughs> Wow. Uh -huh.
almost finished with the life history books for mom and dad, covering their childhood and years up to their marriage. Being with my parents almost daily, working on these books for the past year, has been a highlight of my life. As they have written their memories for the books, my love for them has grown, and I feel so close to them. My father learned the gospel of Jesus Christ from his mother, Orla Greer Houston, who I have named after. Dad was thrilled to call me Orla, who taught me to love the eternal truths that she taught him. I have a few stories from his book that I'll share now in his words. Quote, Jimmy John's store was about three blocks from our home. The butcher, Jimmy's son Bob, was a return missionary. Each time mother sent me to buy groceries, Bob would ask me a gospel question such as, hey Ray, was Adam baptized? I, being only nine or 10 years old, of course, did not know the answer, so, at home, I'd ask mother if Adam had been baptized. She'd smile, and soon we were reading together in the book of Moses about Adam's baptism. Years later, I found out mother had called the store whenever I was on my way to suggest the questions Bob should ask me. I love this next story about how dad's mother showed him to weave his testimony into the fabric of his life. Quote, when I was in the sixth or seventh grade, we had a discussion at school about the most important and influential man in the history of the United States. George Washington and Abraham Lincoln seemed to head the list, but there was mention of Teddy Roosevelt and even Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the current president. When I told mother, she asked what my response had been. I said Abraham Lincoln was my choice. She smiled and told me. Ray, one day, you will say Joseph Smith. And she was, of course, right, as she usually was, close quote. When I was a little girl, Dad was in medical school working many all night shifts at the emergency clinic, and sleep was hard to come by. My parents' bedroom was at the end of a hallway that had a wood floor. We would roller skate down this hall, stopping ourselves with our hands banging on Mom and Dad's closed door. One time, the door popped open, and I fell into Dad's room and realized he was asleep with his scriptures. That image has stuck with me him sleeping with his scriptures on his chest and a pillow over his head to um, block out the racket we were making. <laughs> Obviously, my father loves his family. One of my father's and my greatest um, favorite scriptures is from the Pearl of Great Price. I am Messiah, the rock of heaven, which is broad as eternity. Whoso cometh in at the gate and climbeth up by me shall never, never fall. Wherefore, blessed are they, for they shall come forth with songs of everlasting joy. My Father filled his life on the rock of Jesus Christ, which brought him peace and happiness, his greatest hope is to have his family climb up on that rock with him and never fall. I know the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored in this latter days. I love my Savior. I know he lives. And because he lives, we can all look forward 
to singing those songs of everlasting joy with death when we are all resurrected. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart, yea, the song of the heart, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it will be answered with a blessing upon our head. My parents instilled in us the love of music at an early age. We all took piano lessons, starting at about seven years old. It would be another 10 years before dad was working full time and not in medical school or school. Even though it was an expense that they couldn't afford, they valued our having music lessons and made that financial sacrifice. We had a crummy, old, upright piano, and many of the, of the keys did not even work. And in fact, the, the action was so loose that my piano teacher said, well, it'll help a little bit if you push on the soft pedal the whole time you're playing, and that will make the action a little bit stiffer. So that's really what I always do now. I, it's a habit. I almost can't get out of it. I always have it down because of this crummy piano. Um, there came a time as I progressed, though, that my piano teacher told my folks, you've got to get that child a piano that works. Soon after that, mom and dad and us kids went to a piano store in Los Angeles. Dad insisted that I try all the pianos, and especially the beautiful grand pianos that were in the store. We, after, we left after trying some and went home. But several weeks later, a delivery was made to our home of a seven and a half foot black Baldwin grand piano. Oh my, <laughs> my heart was full. I'm not sure whether, whether any of the other kids got to play that piano, but I sat down and didn't stop playing until two or three in the morning when my folks finally came out and said, you've got to stop and go to bed. <laughs> it was the best gift ever. Dad had a beautiful, deep bass singing voice. I remember the day that I thought I should accompany him instead of my mother. <laughs> it was a bit nervy and obnoxious, I have to say. <laughs> I was about 12 years old and mom said, let me accompany him on this, but you can do it from now on. <laughs> he sang all over the stake in different words when that was a common practice. He also sang in programs. Obviously the songs he sang in church were appropriate for that venue. He, he did have clean hands, Jerusalem, the Lord's Prayer, and many others. Dad's voice was so deep and his um, range so narrow that he always needed his piece, his songs, transposed several keys down. And it was not long before I figured, figured out how to do that for him. Many songs he sang were love songs. I always knew that he loved my mother so much, and when he sang those songs, he was thinking of mother and singing to her. I love the song, My Cup Runneth Over With Love. This last verse applies to them both. In only a moment, we both will be old. Don't you dare cry. I'm not going to look at you. Who's laughing out there? Okay. In only a moment, we both will be old. We won't even notice the, the world growing cold. And so, in these moments with sunlight above, I cut the radical. I am grateful for the gift of music in my life and for my father's confidence in my playing for him, even when I was so young. He always told me, and I'm sure it wasn't quite true, that I was his best accompanist. When dad was 59 years old, he and I recorded all of the favorite songs that he has sung over the many years of his life. Out in the foyer, the tape playing with the video memories is that remarkable recording. In 1 Corinthians we read, I have not seen, nor, nor ear heard, that's the music part, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for him that love them. My father loved God, and he also loved good, uplifting music. I am certain 
that music will be taken to another dimension and that our lives will, conti be, will continue to be blessed by magnificent music when we see our Father again. I am grateful for the plan of salvation that makes this possible and for the gift of Christ's atonement that makes that hope possible. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now have the privilege of concluding the meeting by hearing from Brother Winford by video presentation, singing My Cup Runneth Over with Love, and that testimony. Uh, our meeting will conclude by brief remarks from President Mortimer, and then we'll sing a closing hymn, number 100, Nearer My God to Thee. The benediction will be offered by Brother Jim, Jim Yu, a son in law. And upon conclusion of the meeting, uh, the Linford family will sing a post-lude musical number. And we also want to note that the family luncheon will be held immediately after following the, the post-lude number. Thank you. ago this past Sunday, I was baptized and wore my first testimony. I often wondered when people wore their testimonies how they could say, I know that the church is true, or I know that the Book of Mormon is true, or I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet. I thought, you know, they should be saying, I believe. How could they know? But then as I wore my testimony, 
I knew. I knew for the same reason that the ancient prophet and apostle Peter knew. When the Lord asked him, who do people say that I am? Peter ultimately said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus told him, Flesh and blood didn't tell you this, but my Father which is in heaven. And the Father in heaven told Peter that through the Holy Ghost. And on that day, as an eight year old newly baptized member of the church, the Holy Ghost spoke to my soul, and I knew it was true. And I still know that these things are true. And I stood in the sacred grove. Many times I just stood there and said, yes, I know. And I testify that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. Translated through the power of God by Joseph Smith. And if we know that the Book of Mormon is true, we will also know that Jesus is the Christ, that Joseph was his prophet of the restoration, that the church of Jesus Christ is true, and all the things that came with that restoration, the doctrines, the ordinances, the priesthood, that allowed a man to give to do those ordinances, all of that came by because of the restoration of the gospel. I know that Joseph was a prophet of the restoration. I know that Russell M. Nelson is today's the Lord's prophet. And I bear testimony of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. I don't do this lightly because I know that God knows that I know it. I bear that testimony at the end of all these scriptures and these poems. In the sacred and worthy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to take just a few minutes to uh, greet you on behalf of our state presidency. President Goodrich is out of town today, and I'm President Mortimer, his first counselor, and and uh, it's such a blessing and an honor for me to be here today. And Sister Linford, we love you so much. And we give honor to you and, and to Ray. Um, you know, I, all of you know that Brother Linford and Sister Linford served a lot of missions. And Brother Linford had a lot of opportunities to serve in leadership callings in the church. As evidenced by the fact that we have three emeritus members of the 70 here today with us, and we thank you for coming. Uh, Elder Walker, who I happen to know, we were visiting, and he was the area president when you served in Japan, and he appreciates so much the service that you gave there, and, and uh, we're, I'm so glad that he came. I actually served my mission in Japan as well. So uh, anyway, brothers and sisters, it's interesting, isn't it? that his greatest accomplishment is sitting right here. Riches. I remember my parents were very poor, just as it mentioned that Ray's family was very poor. And as we grew up and when my father passed away, I remember so many people coming to his funeral and saying, oh, your parents were the richest people of all. And you probably feel that way today, Sister Linford, that you are the richest person in the world because of this posterity. Well, Brother Linford has completed his test here in mortality, and he has conquered the adversary. He has received his ordinances. He has kept his covenants, and he is in the paradise of God. And is only fitting, as is only fitting, he will then prepare the mansion for you to dwell in and prepare it big enough for his family. I believe that Brother Linford said the same thing that President Watson used to always say, and that is, no empty chairs. Family, Brother Linford would want you to know 
There's not going to be any empty chairs in heaven in the Linford family. You felt the Spirit here today, and if any of you were wandering or lost, please listen and feel and prepare yourselves to follow His example into the eternities and into the celestial kingdom. President Joseph F. Smith said this, Our fathers and mothers, brothers, sisters, and friends who have passed away from this earth having been faithful and worthy to enjoy these rights and privileges, may have a mission given to them to visit their relatives upon the earth again, bringing the divine present presence, messages of, from the divine presence, messages of love to those whom they have loved in the flesh. I promise you, Brother Langford, will continue to be the patriarch and watch over you from the other side of the veil. And by the way, that's a pretty good view he's got from there. Not many of us can hide. And he will be working on the other side of the veil to bless your lives and help you and work with other guardian angels and our Father in Heaven and Savior through the Holy Ghost to bless you and help you as you continue your test through mortality. And uh, he, as he shared his testimony, I hope you ingrain that in your heart. You know, I, I, with all of those things, I think of Brother Linford as a teacher. Um, ever since I met him, when I was on the High Council assigned to the Fifth Court, every time we would meet and talk, there was a morsel that he taught me. And those were special moments. And he invited me over to his home one day and we visited for a couple of hours. And just, he taught me and he taught me. And when I was called to the state presidency and I would visit, he'd say, you know, President Mortimer, when I was in the state presidency, we tried this. You might want to try that. And uh, he just was continually teaching me. You feel like you were constantly taught by your father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, that's the man that he is and will continue to be if you allow him to continue to influence your life from the other side of the veil. So I add my testimony to his. I know, as he knows, that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that the ordinances of salvation are found in the gospel. Jesus Christ and I know that there is an eternal heaven and that he is there and preparing the way for us I know God loves us I know we have a Savior Jesus Christ and that through his atonement all can be made whole and we need not fear in the name of Jesus Christ Amen, Amen.
Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here today as we have celebrated the life of Ray Housley Linford, the patriarch of this wonderful family and a devoted disciple of thy son, Jesus Christ. We love thee, Father, and are grateful for the plan which thou hast prepared for us that we might be able to return to thee. We love thy son and for the his great atonement that makes this possible. And we are grateful for the Holy Ghost, which we have felt today, and which gives us peace. Help us that we might be able to remember the things that are our Father and uh, his patriarch has taught us, and that we might be able to emulate the things which, uh, which are important, which are reflective of thy Son. At this time, we pray for the family, especially mom. That the veil might be thin for her, and that she will recognize and feel of the covenants and the power that comes through those covenants as she is bound to, to dad. We pray for each of the children that they might also be inspired and that they might feel the presence of their father closely and that they might have great memories and that they might be able to do those things which they know are right based on those things which they learned. Again, we're grateful for the atoning sacrifice of thy son and for the restoration of the gospel, which allows covenants to be made and for us to be bound together as families into thee and to thy son. We pray now that thy spirit might attend us and that we might um, feel of thy love. But we also ask thee that thou wouldst bless us with the a tender heart, soft hearts, that we might be quick to forgive and love each other. And we pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, following the family song, um, you'll be invited to come up and meet the family here up at the front.